the right to waste or to rob by wasteful use the generations to come. That was Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th president, the founder of most of our National Park Service. Original ones, such as the Grand Canyon and the Yellowstone, were his personal favorites that exist because of him, along with one that we later visit, um, the Badlands. We are interested in going to all of these national parks that we're going to tell you about because despite a 15% increase in funding from the national government, parks do not receive enough money to keep up with their own maintenance and they do so much good for communities around them and the environment that they protect that we just really want to make sure that we see it before they're gone. We're going to go through uh, the Badlands in South Dakota, the Redwoods in California, um, the Saguaro National Park in Tucson, and the uh, Grand Canyon National Park in Northern Arizona. So now we'll go to the Badlands. In South, uh, this is the Badlands night sky. There are a lot of different paintings in it that you can actually find in museums because it's just, it's beautiful. It's breathtaking. But the Badlands are, uh, they're just a really big plain that after thousands of years of manipulation from nature have turned into this weird rock structure and uh, things that were buried under the ground for all this time are just on the surface now. It's actually one of, click it twice. It's actually one of uh, the hottest archaeological sites in the United States. You can just walk around and find dinosaur bones. When I was a little kid, my parents took me there, and I found a handful of dinosaur teeth, and I still have them. So I mean, it's that's one reason to go. Go ahead, go back. Or? Yeah, go back. Hand those in one more. There are a lot of different kinds of life that you wouldn't really expect to find in, you know, South Dakota. Uh, the mountain bluebird, the bighorn sheep, and the prairie dog, which, although few carry bubonic plague, are all found <laughs> all over the Badlands. Again, bubonic plague, don't pet them. There's a reason those signs are there. I did not listen. That was scary. Uh, it's also more, uh, home to an animal that I do not have up here, which is bison. Bison are very common in this portion of the United States, and this is why Teddy Roosevelt loved them so much, and why I think we need to protect them. The uh, Badlands are also carved into a mountain chain known as the Rocky Mountains, which also go through Colorado, and they have Mount Rushmore, carved into them, which is another national park. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to visit the Badlands. So many things here. Onward next, uh, south to the Grand Canyon. Okay, so the Grand Canyon is one of the greatest places you can visit in the world. It is a World Heritage Site, and it's, which means it's like nationally treasured, and it's protected by the federal government because it's considered to be so important to, like, the world. And um, it is 1,218,375 acres of land, and it's made up mostly of these raised plateaus, which um, is kind of like these things, like these um, flat top cliffs, and they come out of the, like, up out of the desert just everywhere. And there's a lot of deserts, just like typical deserts that you would think of. And um, up top, there's forests, like you can kind of see in the middle picture there. There's little like trees up on top. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, then there's a ton of animals and wildlife around. This is a particularly unique animal, the condor, and. Um, this is one of the most studied geological landscapes in the world. It's got three of the four main time eras, which is kind of like the layers in the rock. Not exactly, but that's kind of the general idea, and geologists go and study it. And 
it is filled with fossils, and there's an average of 4,000 feet deep in the canyon. So that I mean that's pretty deep, and the deepest part is actually 6,000 feet, and it is 277 miles long and 18 miles wide on average. Um, there's a lot of deep history involved with the canyon. Uh, it became a national park in 1919, and but it actually got federal protection before that in 1893, which kind of goes along with that World Heritage Site. Like it's just so important they wanted to protect it and make sure nothing happened. There's over 4,000 uh, archaeological pieces already discovered within the canyon, and we've only explored 5% of it. Uh, there's only really been three major excavations, which is like just kind of adds on to that 5%. If we've already found 4,000 pieces in there, there's probably a lot more history to find. There's over 12 cultural groups of history in the canyon. And um, I think one of the cool things you can go is if you walk around in the park, then you can see these thousand year old um, remains of architecture, like buildings, like you can see walls or remains of houses and stuff. And um, it's, uh, so many people visit it every year. It's like a world wonder, like I said. It's probably one of the most unique places like it. Uh, the National Parks Association actually said that it's one of the finest examples of arid land erosion in the world, which means like when the river cuts into the rock and uh, makes the canyons, it's probably like the biggest example of that anywhere. And that's kind of unique, so you can't see that really anywhere else. And um, when it first opened, there were only about 45,000 people a year that visited the canyon. Now we get about 5 million. So uh, you definitely don't want to miss out. Um, but there's also a lot of dangers to it, so it might not be here forever. There's, uh, like I said, there's extinct animals such as the condor. and there, I mean, there's other extinct animals, and there's just so much wildlife you can see there. There's over 1,500 plant species, 355 birds, 89 mammals, 47 reptiles, uh, 9 amphibian, and 17 fish species. And that's a lot of animals, if you like animals. Uh, they have a lot of mountain lions that you can see. They're studied up there. And um, it's just really a great place to visit, and I think you should go before it's comes in danger. There's um, a Save the Green program, which is kind of like a regular recycling program that like, you can find in really any park like this. And um, there's also a problem that they're having there is people are trying to develop the land, like uh, big companies are trying to get land on it. And I mean, it is over a million acres, but still, if companies keep taking it, then it will go away at some point. So definitely visit that before it's all gone. Okay, then we go down, or, yeah, down to Tucson. Cool. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, onward south to Saguaro National Park. Now, Saguaro probably sounds like either something you've never heard of or like someone gagging on something. In fact, a saguaro cactus is probably the most famous cactus there is. Any cowboy movie you've ever seen, or western movie, those cacti with the arms, that is a saguaro. Nobody knows the name for it? There it is. <laughs> I own two of them. Uh, the saguaro is a really, really cool cactus. It leans with the sun. Um, people think it's because it has too much water in it but it is because it is smart enough to follow the sun so that it gets the most that it can out of the day. So many different forms of life rely on this, look again, like the Gila monster, which is the only venomous lizard in Arizona, or at least this part of Arizona, but it is huge. This picture does not really show, this thing is like this big, and uh, yeah. That, that's one form of life that relies on the cacti. There's also whiskered screech owls, vermilion fly traps, and um, tarantulas, scorpions, all other kinds of desert life. Those can all be found living in these cacti. 
These cacti are uh, threatened by this thing called buffalo grass. You probably recognize it because we have it here in Indiana too. Some people grow it uh, as decoration in the front yard, but in the desert, this is a really big problem. It does not need much water to grow, so it thrives in the desert. But it's an Asian species that crowds out all of the species that were already living in the desert. And I don't know if you've ever seen the desert, but it's a very open space. And it does not take much to crowd out the species that live there, make them uncomfortable, and they die. The swarrow is labeled as decreasing in number by the National Park Service, which is a problem because there's not really a way to stop it. They have tried to with this park, and they uh, have air raid sort of things. I don't really know how to explain it. Um, the easiest analogy would be if you've ever seen like a helicopter drop water on a burning house. They do that but with pesticides, and it's kind of cool to see. But, um, those are the only two real things that you can do to try and stop it. So that's another reason we wanted to go and see these before they're gone. The, uh, you may ask yourself, what does a national park do for me? Well, the Suaro National Park, one you likely never even heard of, generates $21.9 million in revenue due to tourism in the surrounding area of Tucson. There are so many different things to do in Tucson that wouldn't even really be popular without this cactus. The cactus is so unique to the area that it only grows in a desert found in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and northern Mexico. You can't find it anywhere else in the world, and it's decreasing. So that's why we wanted to make sure we got to see it before it was gone. Now we're going to the uh, Redwood National Forest. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I have the Redwood National State Park Forest. I'm guessing some of you have heard of it. Uh, it is famous for some of the largest trees in America, and some of the oldest and largest trees in the world, in fact. Um, like, you can see, that's actually a real tree. You can kind of get a scale for it of how big some of these trees are. You can literally use them for garages. But back to the banana slope, though. The Redwood Forest has an enormous variety of wildlife, from land animals, uh, little reptiles, amphibians, all the way to different varied aquatic species. This is the banana slug. This is not all the forest has. Um, the forest has things like bobcats, deer. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it. It's a type of salmon, like a co, like a C O H O, like coho salmon, something like that. Um, Pacific giant salamander. Um, and just various forms of wildlife like that. Um, but back to the tree. There is one tree specific in the National State Park. It is known as Hyperion. It is the tallest tree known in the forest as of now. It's the tallest one they have found. And it is a behemoth weighing about 1.6 million pounds. That is a big tree. Um, but some of these trees, the maximum diameter these trees can get is around 24 feet in diameter. Like, that's, yeah. And they can reach a height of like 200, 300 feet, even taller if you let them grow, but that's the tallest any one of them has been recorded. Um, they live around 2,000 years, but um, the forest itself, like the Redwood Forest itself and its ecosystem, has been around for 246 plus million years so far. So you can kind of get a gauge of how long this forest has been. Next picture. Okay, if you didn't know, uh, some of the things in Star Wars were filmed in the Redwood Forest, so if you go back and watch the movies, you can kind of see similarities in landscape between the two if you look at landscape in the Redwood Forest and then look at Star Wars. Alright, but to quickly, like, to compare and contrast, like, it to other type of national parks, it's not really different or, like, any more special in any way than any other national parks. Yes, it has some bigger trees and, like, different forms of ecosystems, but it does not make it any more like important to any other national state park. Um, there are things being done to like preserve and keep this park together, just because it is a very famous park and they want it to last, so um, the National Park Association works with California, and they just kind of do what they can through volunteer work and different things like that, donations, to be able to keep supporting this ecosystem and keep these redwoods alive and 
داری Uh, around average tour, there was um, around 2010, there was like 4,000 or so people on average that visited the park. That number just kind of steadily increased. It fluctuates between visiting, but it normally, I believe, right now is like 6,000 people visiting around that number, and that number kind of goes and decreases with it. But um, yeah, I think that is it. Okay, now, throughout this entire thing, we have shown you a various forms of state parks ranging from South Dakota all the way to New Mexico, and different ones in between. Now, these parks are here right now, but it could be in the future that they may not. The world changes, and as John said before, businesses are taking land from the Grand Canyon, and so soon some of these areas could not be around. So, for the time being, we want to visit or try and do what we can to preserve these national parks so that they are able to last longer and so that future generations are able to enjoy them. Like, why, why wouldn't you want, like, future generations to be able to enjoy something that's been around longer than we have as a species? Um, so, that is, yeah, right here.